Hey everyone and welcome back to another Roundup episode, the first of uh, two today. Yeah, the, the sheer amount of gaming news has been staggering. So right now we've got War 3, we've got Crucible, an insane number of games coming from Take 2 and Embracer, plus a whole bunch more, especially of, uh, especially for those of you who are ticked off by the chunkiness of your game installs and uh, just a few other stories. It's wild. So. Subscribe for that second video coming out later today. The team's going to do all they can to get them both out today. And if you want to help us out, then uh, check out Patreon. We've got physical loot, including uh, this concept piece from our game studio. We've got pins like this as well. Um, plus, of course, the daily briefing, which is your daily TLDR of gaming news, goes up on Patreon and it's bumped to your email and a bunch more. So thanks to you guys for helping us out. And with that, let's get stuck into the news. All right, so we've got an update for Warcraft 3 Reforged. I'm sure at least seven of you care about this. Uh, so basically, here's the core of what Blizzard doing, right? They said their team has, uh, well, it's been too long since they've shared progress. They said that the launch was challenging, that's to put it lightly, and that they've been working on a roadmap to fix up the game and deliver more features. Now, I'm going to keep this one short. So what that basically means is they're continuing to fix bugs on a monthly basis, with desyncs being a big recent focus. They're also doing balance patches, the first of which, um, I think the hotfix notes are actually out. So yes, they are actively balancing the game, which perhaps makes a bit more sense with the new M MMR system that they're implementing, but I mean, there should be a, you know, a classic uh, mode there so that people don't have to play with the balance changes. So, right, MMR, matchmaking, it's now on a per race system. Basically, it seems to be like with StarCraft 2. That's an option that is great, and, you know, personally, I've always found that MMR system in StarCraft 2, which is one of my favorite games of all time, maybe the one. I've always found it to be highly motivating. Now, this is a split between all the different uh, game modes, and Blizzard's post just gives some detail of how it works. Now, for the future, right? They're going to be working on a roadmap, heard that before, uh, that they plan to announce soon, and uh, based on this post, rank ladders, profiles, custom campaigns, and clans seem to be pretty high on their priority list. Oh, and they're also doing global matchmaking, but to cut down on the high ping situations, which by the way, have, from what I hear, been pretty bad the last while, they've uh, basically rolled out server updates that they say has cut down the number of high latency games by 60% since May the 4th. So, where does this leave us as people who maybe at one point were interested in Reforged? Well, I mean, look, I've never doubted that the boots and the ground devs cared about this project, right? I think it's clear, though, that this project struggled, especially given the delays, right? And the gulf between when it came out and when its initial, uh, you know, when its actual initial release date was, you know, like summer, you know, summer following the BlizzCon, and then it was way later that it actually came out. So that clearly tells you that some form of chaos was going on behind the scenes. And really for that, I think it's just a situation where you had these devs, they were just stuck in an impossible situation by management. They didn't have the resources or the pre-production to get the job done to spec on time, so probably some big wig would have seen where this was going and said something to the effect of, this is late, this is over budget, you need to hit this date and cut whatever you need to to get that done. And, you know, like, I've literally seen friends of mine in, you know, who are in the industry be forced into these situations by their managers, and it just sucks. And you would be surprised how, like, pretty senior people in projects can just get overridden, shot down, and quashed by, uh, by some of the higher-ups. So, look, I'm glad Blizzard's sticking to it. There's a long way to go here. It seems like priority number one is to get the War 3 competitive community uh, not be in a, in a disaster situation, but that said, for those of people who maybe wanted redone cinematics or any of that sort of higher vision of the game that they initially launched or announced even, nah. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think you should expect that. And uh, it's Blizzard's loss because if they had have done that, I think a lot of people would have ponied up the cash. Anyway, let's move on. Well, speaking of messy launches, Amazon's uh, first game has hit early access and... Uh, Early access certainly is an apt phrase for this one. Now, when I checked, it was in the mid-30s on Steam. It's now up to 44%, though. And going through the reviews, I'm just getting the impression with Crucible, which is this game, that people are okay with the big picture PvEVP gameplay and the characters, but that their problems come from playing it. That's pretty bad for a game. The core issues seem to be unsatisfying gunplay, movement not being responsive, some messed up balance, some unbalanced hitboxes for the different characters, and performance problems that don't seem to be even across the board, right? It just seems to be a bit sporadic. 
Now, it also seems like the game also doesn't really do a good job of explaining itself, which means that a lot of players just don't really understand the modes and kind of bounce off it. The game is early as hell. It's missing key features that people would expect. So basically, as a product to spend your time on, it is not really hitting the mark. And this is certainly not good for Amazon's first release, like what, outside of the Grand Tour, which really wasn't that good. Uh, now, you know, as to whether this maybe reflects purely on New World, which is their MMO, I mean, that's an interesting question, because they are made by two different studios, so in many ways, there's no reason why, you know, this not being in a great state at launch would impact New World. However, the conditions that led to this being released too early, right, that could impact New World. And it seems to me that maybe seeing the watch time growth with the lockdown, that Amazon decided, wow, people are inside playing games, we need to get a minimum viable product out right now to get that ball rolling with the audience. You know, I've heard watch times are up 30%, 50%. And remember, Amazon owns Twitch, so they would have had early access to all all of this data that just says, launch now, people are watching. So, has that worked? Well, they certainly are getting targeted feedback from players, that's for sure. It might allow for some more iteration. Then as for the New World game, well, you know, there is a worry that they'd maybe push it out far too quickly, but that said, that game has actually experienced an extensive test process, and it has changed quite a lot in its alpha, right? So there is a decent chance, actually, that the needed design iteration for New World has happened, and that it may not see the same situation as this. Anyway, clearly, being attached to Amazon does not guarantee success. This had a rough launch. Breakaway, well, or break, breakaway, whatever it was called, the basketball thing, that was canned during testing, and the Grand Tour was not really that good. Amazon's gaming efforts clearly have a long way to go. Next, well, it's time for an experienced games publisher, Take-Two Interactive, and their honestly insane earnings call. The sheer quantity of projects they've got going on is, it's bloody wild. So, right, they've had a better than expected uh, Q4 fiscal year 2020. And what that means in terms of the beans is 3 billion in net bookings and record digital sales. And then also uh, almost all IPs outperformed expectations. GTA 5, 130 million sales and growing recurring revenue since the casino update. Red Dead 2, 31 million units, 62% net booking growth. Borderlands 3, 10 million units, double out of Borderlands 2 the same time frame, uh, and actually did really well on Steam, better than they thought, and Outer Worlds, two and a half million. That's a lot. They also then recapped XCOM Chimera Squad that that had launched, and that Firaxis is doing a basically a year of DLC, where there's a DLC every two months in a season pass for Civ 6, um, so there's that, and that they're also launching Bioshock Collection, XCOM 2 Collection, and Outer Worlds on the Switch. Then, of course, for Mafia, there's the trilogy re-release, sort of remaster thing, and as a part of that, Mafia 1 has been totally remade. Now, that said, from like, I, I haven't looked into it that much, but from what I understand, the Mafia 2 remaster there, it's not really, like, it's not hitting 60 FPS, it seems to have technical issues, so right now, I have not looked into it, but certainly if you are going to purchase Mafia 2, uh, just think twice, do a bit of reading, I am seeing some early reports that it's not in the best state. Anyway, the first two are, um, I think, out now, but then Mafia 1, of course, they've actually said that, yeah, that's been totally remade, I believe it's coming out in August, so that's a lot of work. We then got the shooter disintegration for, um, in June, uh, June 16th, there's then a Kerbal update on the 1st of July to make up for the fact that Kerbal Space Program 2 has been delayed to 2021. Then PGA Tour is in August. Uh, there's more NBA, more Borderlands, GTA Online, and Red Dead Online content. And then they've got a multi-game NFL partnership that's going to yield its first game in calendar year 2021. Then WWE ba uh, Battlegrounds filling in the WWE slot for this year before they return to the series proper next year. So there's that. But what's more wild is the long term here. They have 93 games planned over the next five years. Of those, 63 are core games, 15 are extensions to existing ones, 17 are mid-core slash arcade games, and 13 are casual. 46 are new IP, 72 are for console, PC, and or streaming, and uh, then finally 26 are free-to-play and 67 are buy-to-play. Whew. I'm tired even reading that. I mean, wow. I think the thumbnail in our Take Two Interactive deep dive from uh, like a, a week and a bit ago, I think it was right, but I didn't think it would be that many games. That's insane. Uh, and then actually a final tidbit, gaming uh, watch time has, or like gaming basically uh, sort of engagement has went up 39%. And then like the watch time for linear stuff, uh, this is in the Q&A section, the earnings call, has went up, I think it was 43%. So that just gives you a little bit of context as to how much lockdown has actually driven, you know, parts of the 
games industry. And certainly then if you apply those numbers from take two over to Amazon, who of course own Twitch, you can maybe start to see why Amazon maybe felt pressured or felt like there was a massive opportunity where if they did not release Crucible right the hell now, then they'd be like missing out on a big marketing success that could have uh, snowballed to, uh, well, I mean, yeah, to the game being a lot bigger, I guess. Anyway, next, um, I mean, if that amount of games has got you tired, then good luck because in a similar vein, Embracer Group are doing a bloody massive 118 games in development right now, 69 of which, nice, have not been announced. That's wild. What the hell? I mean, seriously, that is so many games in the way between these two companies alone. And I've got to wonder, like, you know, how much of that old THQ catalog is included in that list? And then, you know, will we see, like, major franchises come back? To be honest, I've got to imagine so, uh, given the marketing success of their Gothic remake, where basically, right, they, they kind of did, like, a tiny little demo of it, and they sent that out, and they just said, hey, do you, uh, do you want this? Do you want us to do a Gothic remake? Uh, the, the people, you know, saw the demo, said, yes, please, then they did it. So yeah, I mean, man, it just seems like there is a crazy amount of games going on for, um, you know, from Embracer. And by the way, Embracer, you know, that is THQ Nordic, that's Koch Media, that's, uh, you know, loads of those, uh, just loads of those companies, right? One humongous conglomerate. Pretty insane, really. Anyway, with that, let's move on. So we've got a few Call of Duty things next. The uh, title of the next one appears to have leaked, and it seems to be Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, or as people now would call it, Cod Blops Cow, because of course. Now, what I think matters a bit more, though, is what seems to be the method of official announcement here. So, VGC are reporting that Warzone is actually where the reveal is going to happen, right? Now, this would very much be you know, taking a, taking a leaf from Fortnite, really, in terms of having major events that happen in game that are, I guess, just deeply engaging to that core audience and kind of bypass the media, right? It's far more direct to consumer than going to the consumer via the media and stuff like that through press releases. It's, I think, also just more interesting and high effort of a way to announce a game, and it's also one that can get people, well, a bit more, a bit more content, which is pretty cool. Now, for context, right, Warzone has had secrets in its map, and last week, players were able to unlock lock bunker doors and then use secrets to unlock an 11th bunker that uh, basically visually would very much evoke the original Black Ops. Uh, now, there was a nuke in that bunker and that's now making people think that that nuke will be used to revamp the map, which would be just like how Fortnite turns over its seasons and that could maybe also be involved in, say, like unveiling the new game or something like that. And really, this stuff, it's all far more cool and engaging than a press release, that's for sure. Warzone is absolutely going from strength to strength. Call of Duty as a brand is going from strength to strength. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, Respawn's new Vancouver studio is going to have their work cut out for them in competing with this complete juggernaut. I mean, man, I wish, I just wish we had the numbers to compare those two games. I mean, like, man, you know, if only we had the numbers to actually compare those two games, it would be, it would be very interesting, I'll say that much. Certainly, though, yeah, I mean, these teams are going to have to grow big, right? Uh, or there's going to at least be a lot of crunch because just that content war, right? It's to these two companies and they're just going to be battling it out to, to just fight in terms of content. I think that's just going to mean a lot of crunch, a lot of late nights, and uh, certainly I'd say a lot of innovations in production pipelines that are going to need to be done to actually make this whole thing, well, feasible. And then as a final thing, file size, because this latest update was 30 gigs. And that means that if you add it all up, the total file size of that game is insane. Now, if you're not using an SSD, it'll be really slow to load. If you are using an SSD, then a single game will now be taking up a pretty large portion of it. This is a pain in the ass, and it's kind of hard to know how to really deal with this problem. You see, often this stuff happens because more uncompressed assets are shipped with games for the sake of speed at runtime. So it really is quite tricky to deal with, and it's going to be interesting to see like what next-gen storage architectures can actually actually do there or maybe not do. What I'd say is if you have got, say, some custom decompression hardware, uh, you know, we had Mark Cerny saying that the custom decompression stuff uh, that they're doing in the PS4 is sort of equivalent to multiple Zen 2 cores doing the same job. So you've then got to wonder, are you basically going to have compression, decompression, acceleration hardware that would allow developers to, well, basically to ship smaller file sizes in their games because they could rely on really good hardware, uh, you know, just really good speed because of hardware level, you know, compression, decompression stuff going on. Uh, so that could be 
an interesting thing. But if that doesn't happen, I mean, it is just going to be this sort of push and pull. What will, like, what will rise faster? Will it be the number of gigabytes you get per dollar spent on an SSD, or will it be the file sizes of games? And uh, I certainly hope that it's the SSDs getting cheaper. That is what happens. So, there you go. That is it for this episode of the Roundup. Uh, so this one right now, we're getting that off to the editor. Uh, that's uh, So Carl's going to get this one up for you. We're going to get that up as soon as we can. And then, assuming things go to plan, Roundup 2 will follow this one. So uh, that's what's up. Uh, we're all trying as hard as we can to get everything out to you. And I mean, if we sort of toggle it up, uh, you know, we, we do multi-topic videos, right? So... <laughs> A lot of gaming news today is, is the TLDR, so I hope you enjoy that, um, yeah, and th thanks to the team for making it happen, and with that, yeah, just, hey, sub, there'll be one soon, I'll see you next time.